Jen Kuman Tomi, Tanoya, Tanzo Kwetos, Yuan Hartley Kwach Nomi Wit, Wow Jen Kach Kach, Tis Nu Ayel, Tiko Kwen Stalmoch, the Awanox Tans Kwawen. First of all, I am very grateful to all of my elders and my mentors for their instruction in our traditional teachings. It's an honor to be here to talk about rethinking education. And for me, my upbringing began with my grandparents who raised me and my sister and instructed us in the rich teachings of our Coast Salish people through our Squamish Snechum, our Squamish language. My late grandfather, Chief Lawrence Baker, was an orator in our longhouses. We would travel throughout Coast Salish territory down into Puget Sound, Vancouver Island, the Fraser Valley, throughout the Lower Mainland to visit many of the longhouses where the echoes of our ancestors resonated through our languages, through our songs, and our stories. When I was a young boy, my grandfather would take me to the mountains here on the beautiful coast where we have beautiful mountains just an hour outside of where we are today. And this was our playground growing up, traversing the alpine meadows, swimming in the beautiful lakes, and hunting. My grandfather would often instruct us on our spiritual beliefs by showing great respect and homage when we walked through the forest for all of our relatives, the animal people, for the forest, the plants, our connection to to all of our creation. As a boy, I took it for granted that this was common knowledge, that this was something that all of my peers were being instructed in. But as I became an adolescent, I realized how fortunate I am to have had such beautiful teachings. For these teachings were largely oppressed through Canadian legislation. Our languages were forbidden in the upbringing of my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation. So the tenacity and resilience that my grandfather exemplified really instilled pride in my responsibilities. My grandfather groomed me to step into his shoes as a hereditary chief. Since then, I had many other mentors who I honor and remember in my heart, the matriarchs, many of our grandmothers, who were gentle, but also very strict with us. For if we make a mistake, those grannies would not hesitate to pull us aside and scold us and correct us. And it was always very humbling to have these beautiful matriarchs in my life. After graduating from high school, I got accepted into trades. I would have went in and taken up heavy duty mechanics and welding. But I was also offered an opportunity to travel to Chile to visit the Mapuche and live amongst the Mapuche for a couple of months. So I thought, well, I could go to school or I could get an all-expense trip to Chile. <laughs> so it's not hard to imagine the choice I made. I, uh, I traveled to South America. And this was a profound uh, change in the direction of my life to see the oppression of the indigenous peoples in South America, in Chile, under the Pinochet dictatorship, was very stark. Because we had already came through a very dark chapter in Canadian history with residential schools, with the Indian Act, and legislative oppression that is still prevalent today in many ways. So rethinking education, for me, began by traveling and seeing the state in which other peoples lived in, to live in a state of abject poverty was very, very profound to come home to Canada and see the bounty of this land, the richness that many people enjoy, the quality of life here in Canada. So this began my journey to travel to many, many countries to interface with other indigenous groups and leaders, I was asked by former National Chief Ovid Mercury to accompany him to Europe as a youth to represent the Aboriginal youth of Canada. 
he phones me up when I was working one day. He's like, hi, this is Ovid Mercury. Uh, I'd like you to uh, come to Europe with me. I was like, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> sure, it's Ovid Mercury, right? And he says, no, I, I seen you speaking before and wearing your regalia and singing the beautiful songs of the West Coast. So I accepted the invitation and traveled to Europe where many of the countries over there continue to have a preconceived image of First Nations people that is either very negative or very romanticized. Not many people knew the contemporary history of our people. So I continued to travel to places like Tibet. We were invited by His Holiness, the 33rd Minri Trisin, who is the head abbot of the Bonpo religion. And he gained access back to Tibet uh, early to 2000, beginning. And uh, he asked the Squamish nation to accompany him. So we thought, wow. Tibet any time would be remarkable, but to go with a head of state like His Holiness is truly once in a lifetime. So I asked His Holiness, I said, how did this come about? How did you manage to gain access? Did you get a visa or, or you know, years and years since the mid-60s, he had been applying to go back under this, uh, this visa and always denied. So he said, no, I accepted a Chinese passport. I thought, wow, that's a tremendous statement. The optics of this politically would suggest that he's accepting that Tibet is a state of China. So this made me think about relationships. But when we were in Tibet, the hospitality of the people was truly remarkable, for they brought us to many monasteries throughout their lands. And one of the monks posed a question to me. He said, put your stories in chronological order. He said, what would the first story be that your people would tell? So I thought about it. I said, like many cultures in the world, it begins with the universe in darkness. For us as Coast Salish people, we talk about Taskauk, the spirit of the raven, Etakuyetk, the seagull, Etakwakwat Tasquail, the box of daylight. And this story talks about how a raven coaxed and coerced seagull to unlock this box of daylight to unleash that breath of life that created all of the realms of existence. For we believe in many parallel realms of existence, including this physical realm. So our story talks about our first ancestors that were created in Chukwath, over here on the Sunshine Coast in our village of uh, where Gibson's is. And I started thinking about the stories that I heard growing up. I thought about our first ancestors and how that represented human versus human. For at first, these early ancestors, they would have great discussions about Snu'ayich, about the teachings, about Chiach, the laws of creation. But of course, the human impediment started to interfere with their relationship where pride, ego, jealousy, all of these darker sides of our existence in this physical journey started to show themselves, so those people subgrouped. And as the world became populated, many people remembered those teachings. But of course, some people bend the rules. Actually, we all bend the rules in one way or another. But these stories talk about how some people developed peculiar behaviors. So Chaka Anak, the creator, sent down the Chais, the Transformers, Great movie made after them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, the Chais represented these mythical beings who could transform into anything. And as these beings traveled the earth, they came across people and they transformed them. Some they immortalized into these beautiful mountains that you see behind us, Cheoyalhuik and the twin sisters known as the lions. They transformed Tselquam, the Tantalus Range, where mountain goat hunters and their dogs caught in a blizzard. The stories are written all around us. Tlaitka'alsh, Siwash Rock, out here in what is now Stanley Park. These are all ancestors that were immortalized. And they transformed all of the animal people. The Tlatalam, the Squatian, the Takaya, all of the beings that we see today. They were able to transform everyone, in fact, except for Shayetlin, the salmon people. For the salmon were already a very powerful race who lived out in the ocean realm. So the Ka'ais made the arduous journey 
to travel out to implore the salmon, Mechaya, come to this physical realm. The people here are suffering. The land is suffering. We need you. And quotes the spring salmon chief said, why should we? We have no reason for me to send my young people to your homelands. So the Ka'ais implored them and said, we beg of you. So the agreement was that for us as humans, we must respect the beautiful salmon people. And the first salmon of every year that is caught has to be treated like our most honored guest, where the bones, every single bone is put back in the water to facilitate transformation, Nukh'ayansot. So many people followed these teachings, but today we see ourselves again bending rules and veering from our connection to creation. So these stories help us understand our collective responsibilities along with our own personal choices that we make. We continue on with the beautiful mythology of our people that talk about another catalyst of change known as the Ice Age or Ice Ages for it was a succession of waves of Ice Ages. This is where scientists try and pick up our story and tell it for us that somehow we came across a land bridge. This is not our story. This is one story of many. For we talk about how difficult it was for our people, how many people around the world were decimated, the populations dwindled. It was very challenging, not only for Squamish, but for all of us. For we are the direct descendants of those people who survived and endured the Ice Ages. Each and every one of us is connected if we talk about our stories, you'll recognize Kayapalanoch, known as Kepalaino, Khatzlanoch, known as Kitsalaino. These are two great names that connect us back to the Ice Ages. For these were some of the umbrella of families that kept the people alive by sharing their snu'ayeth, their siyithwat, their wealth. And by sharing that with the people, they helped keep us alive. So to commemorate those times, they bestowed lanuch as a suffix to some of those great names as Kepalino and Kitsalino. You will be quizzed at the end, so believe me. Uh, <laughs> but um, these stories, again, talk about catalysts of change. For after the Ice Ages, the waters rose drastically. Not another story isolated to Squamish, but a universal story for every place I've traveled, be it in Aotearoa with the Maori people, they talk about the great floods and how they arrived by their canoes. The Tibetans even showed us Mount Kailash, their beautiful sacred mountain that was their place of haven during this difficult chapter of human history. For us, we have three sacred mountains here on the west coast. Inchkite, you will recognize as Mount Garibaldi. Skalt's quote is Ice Cap Peak in the Ilaho. And Khosak, this beautiful mountain to the south known as Mount Baker. These became our places of safe haven during these floods. The waters were torrent, and the canoes went in all directions. When the water receded, we could not go back to the way it was before the floods. We could not go back to the way it was before the Ice Ages. We can only draw forward that traditional knowledge and apply it in a modern context through adaptation by utilizing the best tools available to us. After the floods, the people developed a wonderful culture, a very rich and vibrant culture here on the West Coast with vast networks of trade and commerce, a strong economy that generated great wealth amongst our people with the bounty of this land. We had what we call taswat tsetsap, professionals and specialists who knew how to navigate the high alpines, known as tlathnayim, the high alpine specialists, right down to the seafloor the Nukschatwaith, the Nukschayith, and all of the hunters, the fishers, the ladies had their disciplines, the weavers, those that procured food. Everybody had a role and a responsibility. And of course, we mark another catalyst of change with the arrival of European cultures in 1791, where we discovered the first ships in our waters here of the Salish Sea. So this is an exciting era. For again, we cannot go back to the way it was during our great-grandparents' day. We can only draw forward that traditional knowledge. So our children today are hungry for mentors, hungry for knowledge. We are continuing to bring the kids out to these mountains as our ancestors have done so for innumerable generations. 
to immerse them in the great canoe cultures as we see this resurgence of tribal journeys along the West Coast. Our languages are near extinction, where we only have maybe a dozen fluent speakers of our Squamish language, but it is not dead yet. It is those little embers of the fire we must blow and bring together to once again survive another catalyst of change and transformation, for we are in tr transition. And this isn't isolated again to Squamish, for all of Canada is learning to grow and mature as a society. For we cannot continue to perpetuate the myth that Canada is founded solely on French and English. That denies our own identity as Canadians, one which is founded on a solid foundation of Indigenous nations. So we go through truth and reconciliation today. It's an exciting era as we see what does this mean to you individually? What does it mean to us collectively? For we have been invisible in our own land for a very long time. And it is now time to celebrate that our history is your history, that this is a part of rethinking education. I'm excited and optimistic at what the future will hold for my children and my grandchildren. We do not want to manage welfare. We want to manage wealth together. And to me, that is an exciting era that we are creating together in this future. I'm looking forward to getting out into the mountains in a couple of weeks to hunt. We're going to bring some of our youth up there in October and November. They're really loud and clumsy, <laughs> but we have to bring them up there and teach them to slow down out of this city life, slow their pace down, be cognizant of their breathing, be cognizant of every step that they take. And this is teaching them to balance their life. I'm very proud of our youth. I'm very proud of our mentors that we had. I am simply a relay runner. I simply accept the baton from my predecessors, ultimately to bestow that onto our future generations. And that, to me, is a continuity of tradition. So I'm excited to be here. I want to thank you all for your attention today to this very exciting topic of rethinking education. I'm known to some people as Ian Ramble, so I won't continue to go on and on. <laughs> But I'm excited about these stories because they truly reflect and inform me as to who we are and where we are in this exciting timeline together and what is possible for our future. So thank you very much to each and every one of you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you.